Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Go to the Source Health Landscape webinar. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation, please use the chat feature located in the lower left corner of your screen. If you need to reach an operator at any time, please press star zero. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded Tuesday, April 23, 2013. I would now like to turn the conference over to Ms. Sarah Walsh. Please go ahead, ma'am. Thanks, Daisy. Um, as she mentioned, my name is Sarah Walsh, and I am with the Foundation for a Healthy Kentucky. I'm delighted to see so many folks already joining the call. And I'm going to steal a minute of Janae's time here to tell you a little bit about this webinar series. Some of you may be familiar with the Foundation's um, Health for a Change training series. For the past couple of years, we have offered webinars and in-person workshops to support the work of emerging and established health coalitions, the folks who are really doing important work about fostering change here in Kentucky. This year, we wanted to expand that effort to specifically address the needs for data users, um, my people. Whether you're a researcher, an epidemiologist, if you're a grant writer for a nonprofit, if you're coordinating the MAP effort at your local health department, if you got tasked with your hospital's community benefit plan, whoever you are, if you're serious about health data, then go to the source is something we've made for you. And if you've ever talked to me for more than five minutes, you've probably heard me mention Kentucky Health Facts. KentuckyHealthFacts.org is a website sponsored by the foundation that was launched in 2008. It's designed to provide anyone, um, we data wonks and the novice users alike, with an overview of the health needs and resources for their community. We have county and state level health data from a variety of sources, and it's a great way to just get that big picture overview. But we know that sometimes you need to dig deeper than the data on that website allows, and sometimes you've got to go back to the original sources of information to learn more. And that's what this series is really all about, to introduce you to some of the key health data tools and resources that are available for Kentucky, and to get to know the people behind those tools. So before we get to today's discussion of health landscape, I wanted to remind you each about the other events in this series. If you haven't signed up yet, you can register for the other Go to the Source webinars from a link on our website. The URL is at the bottom of your screen. It's healthy-ky.org. And next Tuesday, we're going to be back here with Sarah Jeannie Canotra from Kentucky Burfis. She's going to tell us a little bit more about the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System and how that partnership works here in Kentucky between the Centers for Disease Control and the Kentucky Department for Public Health and the University of Kentucky and all the different partners involved in making that data available. Um, later in May, Mike Childress from the University of Kentucky is going to talk a little bit about the Kentucky Medicaid Pharmaceutical Utilization Guide. That's a very complicated name for a very awesome report that has 10 years of data on the different drugs and medications that Medicaid users, um, Medicaid members from across Kentucky have been using. And so we can really compare and contrast what's happening in communities if there's something out of sync. Um, if certain medications are being prescribed more, it may indicate something's going on in the community that we would want to know. Later on, uh, Jennifer Chabinski and Mark Carroza are going to be here with us to tell you a little bit about the Kentucky Health Issues Poll. This is a partnership between the Health Foundation of Greater Cincinnati and our Foundation for a Healthy Kentucky and OASIS, which is a wonderful online tool where you can actually access the raw data. Uh, we do a lot of reporting from that data set. We like to spread the word about what we found. But if you want to get in there and dig deeper and play with the numbers yourself, that's really what OASIS lets you do. And actually, OASIS will let you do that with a lot of um, health data sets as well, not just ours. Later on this summer, um, Michael Price, is going to be here from the Kentucky State Data Center. They are really our link to the U.S. Census Bureau and the Bureau of Labor Statistics and all of the demographic numbers that we really need to know to get an understanding of who the population that we're serving is. Um, I always refer to it as the denominator for absolutely every health statistic we, wor we work with. Then in July, you'll have to listen to me talk a little bit about our Kentucky Parent Survey, which is a new effort that the Foundation for a Healthy Kentucky sponsored. And Amy Swan from Kentucky Youth Advocates is going to tell us about Kids Counts Data Center, 
which is a great source for all kinds of county level and state level um, health and economic and well-being data for children that they're actually launching a new, improved, fancier data center later this summer. So we'll be excited to see what that looks like. Um, this is our first time offering Go to the Source. So I really hope you're going to let us know what you think. If this is helpful, we're going to look at repeating the series or expanding it to cover different data sources. Uh, you will get an email from us tomorrow that includes a link to a short evaluation. It is just a couple of questions. We are data people. Please, please, please provide us with the data. Um, if you fill that out for just a moment, it's going to let us know what you thought of the inaugural Go to the Source series, and we will be able to strive and do better and uh, learn from our experiences that way. Okay, with all of that said, let's dive into today's webinar. <clears throat> our speaker is Janae Grandmont. She is the Data Management Specialist for Health Landscape. And she's going to tell you a little bit more about Health Landscape, how Health Landscape works, how you can access it. Um, but I don't trust her to brag enough about what a great resource this is. So I just wanted to point out that Health Landscape really is the premier award-winning interactive web-based mapping tool for health professionals. They have been showcased at the National Health Data Palooza multiple times um, and other national events. They've launched this family of apps, including the UDS Mapper and the MedSchool Mapper, um, which provide critical information on how to access healthcare services um, and or information on access to healthcare services in our communities. It's um, really kind of an overwhelmingly cool tool that does way more than we'll ever be able to show you just in this hour. Uh, when we featured Health Landscape at our regional Health Data Palooza back in 2011, they absolutely ran away with the Audience Choice Award for uh, Regional Health Innovator. So we were excited about it then. We're still very excited about it, and I hope that you will uh, appreciate and enjoy this talk as well. So without further ado, I will hand things over to Janae. Thanks a lot, Sarah, for that uh, glowing review of Health Landscape. <laughs> um, as Sarah mentioned, uh, my name is Janae Grandmont. I'm the Data Management Specialist here at Health Landscape. Uh, basically, that means that I'm responsible for going out and curating and archiving all of the different data sets that are available inside of Health Landscape, and I'll give you a rundown of those once we actually dive into the application. But what we're going to do today is spend a little bit of time talking about the basic ideas behind the Geographic Information Systems technology. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about how it works, about what people use it for, and then instead of showing you 20 or 30 slides about Health Landscape, I'm going to go ahead and give you a live demonstration of the website. Um, hopefully everything will play nicely, although you know, as much as we love to depend on technology, sometimes it doesn't cooperate. So hopefully we'll be able to get through a, a nice demo of the website, show you its capabilities and what kinds of data we have available to you um, without too much technical troubles. So I'm going to leave a lot of a decent amount of time for questions at the end. Usually when we do our health landscape webinars, we have a lot of people who are interested in very specific data or have very specific questions about the types of data that we have um, inside the system. So we'll make sure that there's enough time for all of that to be answered. Um, and feel free to type that all in during the webinar. Um, Sarah is kind enough to watch the question and chat box for me. So if there's something that comes up that needs to be addressed right away, we'll make sure to get to it. So for those of you who don't have a decent background in GIS um, and Health Landscape, I guess I should probably tell you about that first. Um, health Landscape was originally conceived um, due to the need for better decisions in healthcare. And um, this is where we start talking about it in terms of data-driven data decision making. Uh, Mark Carosa, who is going to be speaking at your webinar later in May, was kind of the original developer behind Health Landscape. He's still um, most, and very involved with the Health Landscape project. And it came out of an agreement with the Health Foundation of Greater Cincinnati and the Robert Graham Center, which is part of the American Academy of Family Physicians. And they're out in Washington, D.C. Most of the development was done when uh, Mark was still at the Institute for Policy Research at the University of Cincinnati. I was actually in graduate school and Mark was my mentor. So I worked on the original inception of Health Landscape um, back in 2004, 2005, and came back three years ago. So it's been nice to see the project kind of come full circle now that we have this great new deployment of it. So it was originally launched in December of 2008 on a technology that's very much outdated at this point. And we just released this updated version that I'm going to show you today 
in October of 2011 at the regional data conference that Sarah was telling you about. Interestingly, Health Landscape has a pretty wide national audience, but we don't really get a lot of users from our tri-state area, which is funny because that's, you know, we're based in Cincinnati, so you'd think that a lot of people in Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana would take advantage of the fact that this, this reference exists. But most of our users come from outside of, of the three states in our little area here. We're going to fix that. Yes, I hope so. So what we like to tell people when we're talking about health landscape and why maps are so important is that if a picture is worth a thousand words, then a map is worth a thousand pictures. Maps are a really great way to help you visualize your data in both space and time in one single picture. So there's no reason to create multiple Excel tables or multiple charts or you know, run your data through multiple types of analysis and frequencies and cross tabs when you can just show it all in, in one little place. So GIS stands for Geographic Information Systems. It's very much um, a, a technology that's been increasing in use and um, awareness over the last four or five years. So you're starting to see a lot of smaller organizations and a lot of um, people who don't necessarily have the technology experience that most GIS specialists did in the past uh, start to embrace it and, because it can understand how much better it is to be able to tell your data story through pictures. So it enables our users to visualize and process data in new ways. <clears throat> At the heart of it, GIS is just a database management system. It's a system for inputting, storing, processing, and retrieving spatial data. And when we talk about things like spatial data, that's referring to information about the locations and the shapes of different geographic features in a specific geographic area. And there's three main types of geographic features, and those are points, polygons, and lines. And I'm going to give you an example of each of those. And it also includes all of the data that are associated with each of those features. So the way that the process works, if you were to go out and get a, an ArcGIS desktop license to conduct your own geospatial analysis, is that you have to collect and compile map layers. So you need to find things like your census tract shapes, your county shapes, state shapes, build it into a database, and amass all of the different data that's associated with all of those different geographic entities. So if you were interested in poverty, You'd have to go out and find all of your census tract um, shapes, and then you'd have to find all of the poverty data associated with those census tract shapes, and then you'd have to link them together. And then you can use those to get information about how to understand or solve a problem or tell the story of your organization. The really neat thing about Health Landscape is that it does all of that pretty much for you. So talking about using symbols to convey information, all of the symbols are going to be based on the attribute values that are attached to each geographic feature. So when we're talking about things like points, you can shade them using different colors. You can have different shape of points. You can have different types of outlines. And all of those different things are going to indicate that one point is not the same as the other. Polygons are things like census tracts and counties. And you can distinguish differences between those geographic entities using different colors, different patterns, and different types of boundaries. And then lines. You can distinguish differences by using different widths and different colors. We don't have a ton of lines in health landscape. Um, in health data, there's not really a lot of interest in things that have line symbologies other than rivers if you're looking at um, things like toxics release data. So we're not going to spend too much time on that. So here's an example of how to convey information using point data. What I have here are three different spreadsheets, all showing different points. Um, the top left is showing you hospital data. You see an address, a zip code, and a hospital type. The top right is showing you data for a federally qualified health center delivery site. And the bottom left is showing you the data for the health, uh, federally qualified health center grantee organizations. So we've got three different data sets that are all showing information that's of use to, some, to, to, um, excuse me, to organizations who are looking to apply for federal grants to expand their capacity. Rather than trying to find a way to show what, how all of these um, data sets interact together using Excel or using some other kind of uh, descriptive text, you can put all of those points together on a map, which is what you see in the, in the right-hand corner of the slide. So all of the hospitals are represented by the hospital symbology. You see the blue for short term. Um, I don't see any reds in there for critical care, but then the yellow ones are um, long-term hospital facilities. The large circles represent the grantee organizations, and the smaller circles represent all of the healthcare delivery sites. 
And we further gone and colored those by grantee. So all of the pink dots, um, yeah, those look pink. I apologize, it doesn't look like the slide color came through very well. But all of the pink dots in the northern section of Hamilton County all belong to one grantee. All of the yellow dots belong to another grantee. The um, farther south one should be orange, but it looks like the same color pink to me, um, belongs to yet a third grantee. So you can see how the different organizations in our area are linked really quickly using a picture rather than trying to write it out. Same idea with polygons. Um, here you have an Excel spreadsheet that's showing you the percent of low-income population that is unserved by any federally qualified health center. And this is showing you the data by ZICTA, which is short for zip code tabulation area. All of this uh, UDF data, which I'll talk briefly about UDF mapper, so long as we have time at the end, is reported at the zip code tabulation area rather than at the zip code level because those are defined by the post office and they don't change very often. Um, I don't know how many times my zip code has changed in my adult life, even though I've been in the same house for eight years. It's been at least through three iterations. But ZICTAs are relatively stable, so it's easier to track data over time. But now we can put all of that information together. So here we have those same polygons showing the unserved population, but we also have the location of all of the health centers. So you can see in the darker colored ZICTAs, indicate that there's a lack of access to health care. And you can see where you might be interested in putting a health center facility so that people in those areas can, can get access. So that's kind of the basics of uh, GIS technology and, and what, we're, what we're talking about when we mean point and polygon data. I just wanted to make sure that we had some of those really basic concepts covered before I get into health landscape, because um, sometimes it gets a little confusing if you're not familiar with all the terminology um, that floats around surrounding this technology. So I'm going to go ahead and jump over to the internet and hopefully in a second you'll see my my own home screen with Health Landscape on it. If you haven't signed up for a Health Landscape account yet, you can go to healthlandscape.org and do that. It's uh, free to access the site. It's free to use all of the data. And you can click on New User, Register Here. It's pretty self-explanatory to sign up for a new account. The only caveat I will give you here is that our, um, our account creation does not work in Google Chrome. So if that's your preferred browser, you're not going to be able to, to create an account using Chrome. You can do everything else inside the site, but for some reason Chrome does not play well with Flash-based forms. Um, and speaking of Flash, if you try to use this site from an iPad or an iPhone, you're going to be sorely disappointed because iPhones and iPads don't support Flash browsing. We're in the process of starting development on a JavaScript version that will allow you to use it on, a, on an iPad or iPod, iPod device, um, but that's still a couple months down the road. So once you've signed up for Health Landscape and created an account, you can go back to the home screen and log in. And I'll do that right now. And the first thing that you'll see when you log into Health Landscape is a map of the United States. Um, we do have specific deployments for different geographic regions of the country. So Cincinnati, for example, has its own data portal. Uh, North Carolina has its own data portal. We've got one up in Halton, Canada. So all of those are focused more specifically on certain regions of the country. So the home page will look a little bit different depending on where you're coming from and where you're looking. But this is what it's basically going to look like for everybody else. So just to orient you real quickly to the tool itself, um, here in the uh, top left, where, which is taking up most of the graphic space, is the actual mapping application. So this is where all of your interesting pictures are going to pop up. You also notice that there's a couple of different tabs up here. We have a map tab, a data tab, which is empty right now. There's also chart and graph tabs. Um, those are for different tools, uh, such as the data portals that I mentioned earlier that have time series data. In the next couple of months, most of the health landscape data that's available for different years is also going to be incorporated into those tabs as well. Um, on the left-hand corner, I know most of you are local and not interested in Alaska, but it's kind of difficult to zoom to Alaska from, from this particular screen, so we've got some quick zoom buttons. And then you can change the view extent using the zoom bar either by clicking on the plus and minus signs, clicking on the hashes in between, or using your mouse and using the shift key and drawing a box around the area that you're interested in looking at. 
over here on the right is the toolbox that goes along with Health Landscape. So you'll see right now I've got four different options um, in my toolbox. I have quick maps, base maps and optional layers, layer controls, and login and account settings. Login and account settings is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. If you want to change your password or change any of the other information that's associated with your account, you can do that using those boxes. If I click on the Tools button, this is where all of the interesting pieces of Health Landscape are located. So you'll see I actually have a few different tools than you would see if you logged into Health Landscape using your own account. Um, I've got some admin accounts and some test accounts, some different tools that we're working on development for. And so you're probably only going to see about half of these, um, but those are really the, the interesting ones anyway. So I'm going to start by showing you a tool that we call Quick Maps. And this is just a really great way to very quickly look at geographic distributions of data. We've got two different sets of quick maps. We have regular quick maps and ACF quick maps, and they both serve the same function. So I'll start with regular quick maps, and then I'll talk very briefly about the ACF set. We've got some interesting demographic information, and the reason that we've presented these six demographic indicators is because our, previous, our usage of the previous version said that these are the ones that they'd be most interested in. So I'm going to go ahead and turn on unemployment rates, zoom back out one level. Um, the, the neat thing about Quick Maps is that it shows you different variations at different levels of geography. So the first one that you're going to see is the state level geography. And then as you zoom the map in closer, you'll see it starts to change from state to county. Eventually it will change from county to track level data. And then where it's available, we also have block group level data. Um, for this particular indicator, I'm pretty sure block group level data does exist. It's just a matter of how far in I have to zoom. So there you go. There's our block group level data of the unemployment rate. Down here in the bottom left hand corner, you'll see your legend. So it's telling you what each of the different color gradations represents. And then in the bottom center, this is where your metadata is going to live for your quick maps. So this is telling you that this map shows you the unemployment rates in the United States for 2010. It includes all of the civilians aged 16 and older who are classified as unemployed. Um, it also includes a link for more information. So if you want to get more information about the source data, it will take you directly to the page where we um, source this indicator from. So I live in Cincinnati, so I know this is Hamilton County, but most of you probably don't, um, especially if you're from Southern Kentucky. So I'm going to come over here to the Base Maps and Optional Layers tool, and I'm going to turn on my state and county layers for reference. So now you'll see I've got the boundary of Ohio and Kentucky, and I've also got the county boundaries. It's a little bit hard to read them, so I'm going to go over into my layer controls, and I'm just going to change the transparency of the unemployment a little bit just so that we can see the layer names a little bit easier. So in addition to the regular quick maps, we've also introduced a tool called ACF Quick Maps. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the American Community Survey, um, it, the five-year estimates have been coming out for a few years now. So I'm, I'm assuming that everyone has had a chance to familiarize themselves with this really, really useful bank of um, census-type data. But it used to be that the census had the long-form version and the short-form version. And I was very disappointed the first year I got my census as an adult, and I only got the short-term version. It was very distressing as a data person because I really wanted to fill out all the questions. And then 10 years later, I was really excited to have the chance to get the long-form version again. But by that time, they had discontinued it and gone to the American Community Survey instead. So again, big disappointment. <laughs> but the neat thing about it for me is that now I can get access to all of this demographic data on a yearly basis. So whereas before you had to wait 10 years between decennial census to get census track level data on things like poverty and employment status and income, now you get it every year. And that's really, really awesome for data people. Um, so I'm, very, I'm still very excited about that. Very disappointed that I never got to fill out my long form and I still haven't been called for the American Community Survey, but I can appreciate it from the data geek perspective because now I get access to all kinds of neat things every year. So this particular tool is actually based on older data. It's a 2005 to 2009 tool. The reason the older data is in here right now is because we're right now building the um, 2007 to 2011 version. These quick maps take up a lot of processing space, 
for us. Um, everything is stored as a little tiny image rather than being stored as actual data. So I'll show you how you can get access to the actual data behind it when we talk about another tool. But again, it's the same idea. You've got things like um, sex and age, race and Hispanic origin, income, poverty. So let's go ahead and look at the percent of people under 18 below poverty. And you'll notice that when I added that to my map, it put it on top of my nice, pretty county and state boundaries. So I'm going to go back, back to layer controls and drag that back down so that my state and counties are back on top. And again, play with the transparency a little bit so that I can actually see what I'm mapping here. Um, same idea in your bottom left-hand corner. You have your legend, in the middle, your metadata with a link back to the ACS website. Now what you'll probably notice right away if you're you know, looking for the actual numbers behind pictures, like I tend to do, is that there are no numbers associated with this picture. You've got areas of dark purple, which obviously indicate areas where there's a higher concentration of poverty, but you don't know between these tracks which one is higher, which one is lower, and what those values actually are. There's a pretty big range between 29% and 100%, and we're not really sure exactly where these particular tracks fall along that continuum. So what we've done to alleviate that issue is we've redeveloped our tool called Community Health View. Now in the original version of Health Landscape, Community Health View is really kind of the, um, the bread and butter, the really important part of Health Landscape because it was the library that gave people access to all different types of social data, publicly available data sets that they could stick on a map and use it in their own reports, use it for their own research. The problem was it was very tedious to use. Um, it used to be that this whole right-hand side was just a giant list of data sets and variables and you couldn't search for anything. It was, it was very user unfriendly. So when we redeveloped it, we made sure to include a couple of different features. The most important one, in my opinion, is the search box because now you can actually search by keyword. So if you're interested in poverty data, you can just type in poverty and it will automatically search through all of the different data sets in Health Landscape and come back with just those that have any information about poverty inside of them. The other thing we did was to break out the search to be able to limit it by different geographies. So if I'm interested in state level data or county level data, I can uncheck states and it will show me only data sets that include data at the county level. Hold on one second, it looks like my screen's frozen. Okay, much better. You'll notice that tracks are missing from our uh, geography list. Tracks will be available at the end of the summer. Um, when we finished developing the tool, we realized that it was a little bit taxing on people's browsers to keep bringing in that much data. So it, <coughs> excuse me, it ran a little bit slower than we wanted it to. So we're redeveloping some things on the back end and we're going to introduce track level data by the end of the summer. So what I have now is a list of all of the data sets in Community Health View filtered to data that's at the county level and data that includes information about poverty. So I'm going to come down here to the American Community Survey five-year estimates about poverty and income and select that data set. <clears throat> if you're confused about what the different types of data sets are, you can click on the About tag and it will bring up the metadata page. And it looks like my screen size is forcing this to be formatted a little oddly, so I apologize for that. But it tells you where the data are coming from, gives you an abstract of the data set, a description, and then it gives you a very much um, unformatted list of all of the different variables that are inside of this data set. So if you're looking for something specific without having to go through each data set and scroll through all the variables yourself, you can take a look at the metadata and see if it has what you're looking for. So let's say that I'm interested in looking at the percent who are below 100% um, of the federal poverty level, and we're going to go ahead and look at the kids that are below 100% of the federal poverty level. And again, this is county level data, so I'm going to zoom out to a slightly larger area. And now you'll see that when I move my mouse over the top of any given county, I can actually see a number attached to it. If you see that pop-up box on the top left-hand corner of your screen, that's what we call a data tooltip, and it tells you the geography that it's associated with. So right now my mouse is pointing on Hamilton County, Ohio, and it tells me that the percent of the population under 18 that's below 100% of the federal poverty level is 23.6, so 23.6%. I have the access to the same kind of legend, 
But I've also got access to a whole bunch of other tools down here. In addition, I can add increasing amounts of information to the tooltip by clicking on all of these checkboxes down here, which represent all of the other variables that are inside of the data set. So now when I roll my mouse over Hamilton County, I can find it again. Oh, we'll just pick Clinton. Um, you'll see that in addition to the percent below, percent under 18 in poverty, I've also got information about the median household income, the uh, 65 and over population below the poverty level, and a whole bunch of other variables that I chose to include in my data tooltip. In terms of the other options that are available to you using Community Health View, you can change the color scheme from quantitative to qualitative. So if you had a data set that had qualitative values and you needed different color options, you can do that here. Same thing with diverging. So if you had things on a negative to positive scale, you can easily pick a color palette that would match um, the divergent color scheme. Um, speaking of color palettes, you do have a couple of different options for your colors. A lot of times people just want to come to Health Landscape and make a map of poverty of their area and then take it and drop it into their own PowerPoint presentation to use to defend the case for their organization. So if you have certain colors, for example, the Health Foundation's colors are purple, you could find something that would suit your needs. You can also change the number of categories that the data are divided into. Our default is four. Um, some people like to go a little bit more granular with five or six. You can go all the way up to nine once you start getting above that. It doesn't really tell you anything new and interesting, so we, we've left it at that. You also have the option to look at the map from a threshold perspective rather than a thematic perspective, where I can come in and say, I only want to see the counties where, the, where more than 50% of the population under 18 is in poverty. So it will automatically go through the data and filter it down and show me only the counties that have more than 50% in poverty. So it's just a different way of breaking up the data, a different way of displaying it. And sometimes the threshold way of looking at things is a lot more interesting than the thematic display. You can also look at the data that's associated with Community Health View. Not sure why my tab is grayed out. Let me refresh my page. Hold on one second. Sorry about that. Every once in a while I have this little bug when I'm on webinars that never likes to cooperate with me the way I want it to. There's always something. I know. It's funny how that works. We'll just go ahead and pick a different data set, whatever's on top. Um, but here in the data tab, you'll see that this includes all of the data that's associated with this data set. And this just happens to be an older version of the American Community Survey. So it tells me what county is associated with it, the state and county FIPS codes, the area name that's that comes directly from the census, and then all of the data associated with each record. And I can actually export that data and take it down to my own desktop, save it as a CSV file or an Excel file, and then I could use that in SAS or SPSS or however other way I wanted to use the data on my own terms. So that's kind of one of my favorite features about Health Landscape is that you can actually take the data with you if you needed to do something else with it other than stick it in a map. Okay, so that's all of our data available in Health Landscape, and there's tons of data. I mean, we have someone, in addition to myself, whose sole purpose in, in life at Health Landscape is to go through and find neat data sets to include. So we have the Bureau of Economic Analysis data, we have Census data, we have Centers for Disease Control and Prevention data, we have mortality data from CBC Wonder, we have Appalachian specific data, um, death rate data, information about mortality from um, infant mortality records, local area unemployment statistics, crime data, Robert Wood Johnson data, and I could spend the next 15 minutes just telling you what data sets we have inside of Health Landscape, but it would probably be more interesting and useful to you if you actually sign up for a Health Landscape account and make your way through them all um, at your leisure. The other thing about signing up for a Health Landscape account is it'll put you on our mailing list, so when we do release the track level data in Community Health View, you'll, you'll know exactly when that happens, as soon as it happens. So that's our curated collection, but let's say that you have information that you want to add to Health Landscape on your own. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have organizations that actually collect your own data, but here at the Health Foundation we do have some surveys that we conduct uh, every couple years where you might want to upload that data to, to Health Landscape so you can make your own maps of your own personal data. So what I have here, for examples, are two Excel spreadsheets, one showing you the, the uh, poverty by census tracts for Hamilton County, Ohio, 
and another one showing you the location of all of the infant mortality deaths in Hamilton County. The years don't match up, so as data people, I know this is really going to annoy you, but it's just for demonstration purposes. I promise no one is being analyzed based on this demo. So what we're going to do is look at two different tools inside Health Landscape. We have Quick Geocodes and Quick Themes. Quick Geocodes is what you're going to use when you're looking at point level data, and Quick Themes is what you're going to use if you're interested in mapping um, thematic data, so things like census tracts, counties, states. We can do custom geographies, so if you have neighborhood data that you need into Health Landscape, you can certainly contact us and we'll help you to get that inside of Health Landscape. So let's start with quick theme data. Um, what I'm going to do is click on the button that says click here to begin. It's as simple as coming over to my spreadsheet, copying it directly out of Excel, and then pasting it back into Health Landscape. So now you'll see that it's automatically populated this screen with all of the data. This geo ID column represents the FIPS code. For those of you who are not familiar with FIPS codes, it's a unique identifying number that's attached to pretty much every standard geography. Um, again, if you have data and you don't understand what the FIPS code is or don't know how to find the FIPS code, you can contact us and we'll be happy to help you figure out um, how to link that up with your data. But this is the codes for all of our census tracts in Hamilton County. So I'm going to tell Health Landscape that it is track level data and it's using the 2010 census boundaries. The ID is GeoID Recode. And then when I click on Load, it's going to bring all of that data into the mapping application and eventually it will display it on the map. There's 200 and 221, I believe, census tracts in Hamilton County, so it may take just a minute. While we're waiting for it to load, um, you can give the data set titles. So if I wanted to give it the name of the census tract as the title, that's what would appear in the tooltip. You can group the data by group or category. You can attach a um, website to it so that when you click on each um, county, it'll pop up a link that you can click on to go to that county or census tract. And then you can, if you have a note field in here that has more information about the geography, you can use that as well. You can also include information in the tooltips, um, as I showed you with Community Health View. So if I wanted to add all of these different variables to the tooltip, when I mouse over that census tract, it's going to show us um, what those values are. So we'll go ahead and look at the percent of poverty with families with kids. And this is all of my data that I just uploaded by copying and pasting into Health Landscape. So now you can see by census tract in Hamilton County, um, which census tracts have higher concentrations of families with children in poverty. So let's say that I think that there might be some kind of correlation between poverty and infant mortality. So I want to upload all of my infant mortality data and look at them together so that I can see if there's any kind of relationship. I'm going to go over to Quick Geocodes, click on here to begin, and then I'm going to come back over to Excel and take all of my address or point level data out of Excel and move it back over into Health Landscape. So you'll see that inside of this data set, I have an address and a zip code. I don't have a city or a state. I do have a state. I lied. I don't have a city. You don't need a city or a state. The only things you really need are an address and a zip code. And the geocoding engine works pretty well just based on that. The way it works is it automatically will default to zip code and address. The city and the state are only really there just in case it has a problem locating it based on either of those two fields. So I've also got some other information associated with this data. I have whether or not it was neonatal or postneonatal. I have a race variable. And I've got things about malformation, low birth weight flags, and whether or not there were any maternal complications. So I'm going to tell Health Landscape where my address is. I don't have a city, so I'll leave that blank. And it's automatically guessed our state and zip code categories. And then when I click on geocode, it's automatically going to start populating this map with the points in my data. And just because I have seen to have uploaded two different blue data sets, I'm going to go back to Quick Themes and change that to red so we can see that a little bit easier. So you'll notice that it's continually recentering my map. Um, every 20 to 25 uploads that it geocodes, it will reorient the, the mapping screen so that you can always see where your points are. It looks like there's some interesting outliers over here that aren't actually in Hamilton County but we'll go ahead and just focus on our county right now. 
Okay, so here we can really quickly and easily create a map that shows you the poverty and the infant mortality. Um, you can use the same indicator and the same um, drop-down boxes to include things about title, group it. Um, if I had a URL or any notes, I could do that. Um, let's go ahead and group these by race. So now you'll see that it's automatically assigned different color values depending on what the value is inside of my data set. And the neat thing about Health Landscape is that you can layer all of these things together. So I'm looking at my quick themes data, I'm looking at my quick geocodes data. If I wanted to go into my base maps and add things like hospitals or federally qualified health centers, I could do that as well. So we've, we've got some information from the HRSA Geospatial Data Warehouse on health centers, um, health center lookalikes, rural health clinics. All of that is all available for public use. We've also got information on the health professional shortage areas and the medically underserved areas. So we can add those to our map um, and see, start to see where the different relationships are between access to health care and higher rates of infant mortality. The other option that you have with Quick Geocodes is to save your data set. So but in both Quick Geocodes and Quick Themes, you can save as new ID. Right now you can save up to three data sets. We're working on being able to expand that capacity. And then next time you log into Health Landscape, that data will be there for you to use. You can share your map. If you click on the share button, it will automatically generate a unique link to this particular map. The only drawback, not drawback, um, thing to keep in mind is that the person you're sharing it with also needs to have a Health Landscape account to be able to log in and view the information. You've got a couple different options for printing. If you want to print the map to a PDF or to your printer, you can click on print. Um, I like our print function because you can actually recenter the map, resume, get it to the exact layout that you're interested in before you print it. But a lot of people report that the way that they export the maps from Health Landscape is to use the print screen function. So if you just wanted a picture of the map, you could click on print screen. You could open a program like Word or Paint and paste the map inside and then crop it to fit the exact area that you need for your paper or presentation. In the next version <coughs> that we're working on developing, we're going to have a different variety of print options, including save a JPEG of just the map. Um, that's been something that's been requested a lot. It's just a matter of folding it into the, the next version of Health Landscape. So that is Health Landscape in a nutshell. Um, as I mentioned earlier and Sarah mentioned earlier, there's another site called udsmapper.org. So if you work with health centers or access to health care, that's another one that you might want to check out. If you have any questions um, after today's webinar, you can use the Contact Us form. Again, this form does not work in Chrome. So if you try, you're not going to be able to see any of these um, drop-down boxes. But Mark and I are both on the other end of this Contact Us form, and we're both pretty good at getting back to um, emails in a pretty timely manner. So if you have any questions that come up or any questions about data sets, things that you'd like to see in Health Landscape that we don't have included. Um, there have been numerous times we've been at conferences talking to people and they've said, oh, by the way, we have this Institute of Medicine data. Can you add this to Health Landscape? And we like adding new data sets. We like getting suggestions on data that we're missing or might be um, overlooking. So we definitely take all of the, our suggestions pretty seriously and we do incorporate a lot of them in the mapping application. So I think I can get back to the um, webinar slide somehow. Here we go. There you go. Got it. And this is uh, my contact information and Mark's contact information, so you get a little bonus here. So if you have any questions, feel free to email or call. Um, and then a list of our two other big websites, udsmapper.org and medschoolmapper.org, um, except I will say that as of the end of August, all of that will live at healthlandscape.org. So all of the UDS data is going to be part of Health Landscape as well, which we're pretty excited about. So that's all I have um, in terms of walking you through the application. Does anyone have any questions? That's I know awesome. it's a lot of information for a, a short time. I'm impressed you're able to cover so much. I'm going to give folks a minute to um, chat in their questions while they do that. Um, I had a question because you showed me some stuff that I didn't know was available on Health Landscape. With the different home pages, because um, I think we've probably got some folks from Northern Kentucky on the call. If they just log in from somewhere in northern Kentucky, do they automatically see a different home page? Not at this point. Um, okay. Those are all unique links. So um, Cincinnati has the Facts Matter data portal. There is a little bit of northern Kentucky data in here, so I'm just going to go ahead and 
as you realize I'm not sharing my screen. Hold on one second. I'm just going to go ahead and, and pull that up real quick. For any of you who happen to be in the very northern, northern quadrant of the area, it's at factsmatter.info. And this is all of the very local data. Um, Health Landscape has developed these community data portals, but we actually aren't the ones who are responsible for populating it with data. So this is covered by the United Way of Greater Cincinnati, the Greater Cincinnati Foundation, the Health Foundation, and a few other different entities. And this is all data that they have decided is useful to our area. So in this instance, you would have a different, <coughs> excuse me, a different home screen, but that's not necessarily going to be the case um, for anyone who doesn't have a data portal to point to. And then if I were to use the Facts Matter site, it certainly looks like all of the same tools that you just showed us on Health Landscape. Yes, um, you will have them. access to the Quick Themes and Quick Geocodes and all of the Quick Maps tools. Um, Community Health View is not a part of the data portals, um, but this is an example of where you can see the charts and the graphs of time series data and different ways of breaking up the data as well. So, so if this is your area and you happen to be in the very northern reaches of Kentucky, then factsmatter.info is another um, good site for you to visit as well. Very cool. Hmm? Um, I had one more question about when I add data to the site, like if I have my own data of, you know, here at the foundation we have grants that we've made or programs we've worked with, um, does that then become public to anyone? Do I, can I add my data and not show everyone? Or yes. Um, when you upload data using Quick Themes and Quick Geocodes, that is your private data. Um, so it, it's only going to be accessible to you when you log in in your um, list of data sets that are available. And if you share the link, then people will be able to access it as well. Um, that's not to say that it's um, HIPAA, HIPAA compliant. We Health Landscape also has a component called the Health Center Mapping Tool, which is not currently live because we're working through all of the HIPAA security issues. So I wouldn't upload social security numbers or patient level data just yet. By the end of the summer, you'll be able to do that as well. But nobody else will be able to access your data set. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. But if we did have something that was public and useful, we could, we could tell you about it and then you'd consider it. Yes, adding. definitely. We, we used to have a nomination form where you could flag data sets that you wanted to include, but we found it's just easier to, to let me or Mark or uh, Michael, our other data person, know. And um, we'll go out and get that and format it the way it needs to be for Health Landscape and add it to our pool of data sets. Great. Those were my questions. I don't know if anybody else had burning questions that they didn't they needed to have answered. We'll give them another minute, though, just in case. And again, if anyone has a question that they think of when they're inside of Health Landscape playing around with it themselves, feel free to give me a call or send me an email. And we do regular webinars for Health Landscape. I think we have an intro webinar about twice a month. We also have a data portal specific webinar once a month. And then we do a lot of one-on-one -on -one training sessions. So if you feel like this brief overview is just a little bit too much information to take in all at once, we'd be more than happy to set something up to do something one-on-one -on -one as well. Yeah, I think you really need to kind of get in there and play with it to really um, get a feel for it. But it's amazing just the number of things the health landscape can do. And I can't speak for everyone. I know that I spent an entire semester trying to learn how to use ArcGIS, and it was costly and confusing and not available to everyone and way harder to use than Health Landscape. So I'm, yeah. I'm delighted that Health Landscape exists. Well, I'm glad that you're delighted. The license fee for ArcGIS is, is very prohibitive for a lot of nonprofit organizations. Um, so we're glad that we have a way to, to allow people to use that technology. Well, with that, I, I guess if we don't have any questions, I would just say, Janae, thank you so much for joining us. And Thank you for having me. I hope the rest of the series is great. Um, we'll let everyone get back to their Tuesday, and hopefully we will see you next week to talk about Burfist. And I hope that when everybody gets the email link to the evaluation tomorrow, they will let us know what you thought. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.